from New York City. For our viewers worldwide, a very good morning. I'm Manus Cranian for Jonathan Farrell. We're really grappling for some kind of stability in these equity markets. As yields continue to rise, geopolitics is still unsettled. Go the banks! Bank of America bid up this morning. In the eye of the storm, banks are your stability. Come down to the open. Kicks in right now. Everything you need to get set for the start of U.S. trading. This is Bloomberg The Open with Jonathan Farrow. <laughs> Coming up in the show, futures steady as traders digest the latest Fed speak and data. Bank of America, Morgan Stanley, the results impress. And Putin calls for restraint from Iran, according to the Kremlin. We begin with the issue of the day. It is big bank earnings. Let's wrap it up. Overall, provision expense is mixed. We saw provision rise for B of A this morning, which is a good thing because they had a pretty healthy step up of their net charge-offs. I do think it's interesting that we're seeing deposits act very well. Deposits grew for the whole system in Q1, and they were higher for B of A this morning. You're particularly seeing that in the wealth management business. Uh, for B of A. I also think that the balance sheet is seeing a little bit of expansion on the securities book, which is another way for the company to try to manage net interest margin, take advantage of higher interest rates. Let's get through some of these results now. Shanali Basik is with me. She's had a busy morning. So if I listen to Brian Moynihan, sounding strong, we are different, very much a musculature there. Uh, and Morgan Stanley, uh, I love what we had on, on, on the chat, which was, you know, showing a bit of form rounding down rather than rounding up, but a good performance on both the banks. You have a good performance, and investors really looking to hold on to the good news here. Net interest income rising at Bank of America, and even with compensation expenses coming in above estimates. And remember, pressure on that line, even with headcount being reduced over the last couple of quarters, they make the point to investors, analysts on the call right now, that expenses are up 2% while inflation is 4%. So even there, they're pledging some discipline. Of course, they're navigating costs tied to the FDIC special assessment as well. So that net interest income, of course, good news. We'll see if they give any new guidance for what to expect for the year. Over at Morgan Stanley, a similar story. The good news is in the main business, that wealth manager, $95 billion of net new assets, if you could believe it, versus about $61 billion, which is what analysts had expected. Now, they also beat on investment banking and trading figures as well. I would say, however, competition is hot. You have equities trading coming in below Goldman Sachs. We have all the numbers out now. We know who the winners and the losers are, and the competition in a volatile market certainly is getting hot as underwriting comes back. Wealth well. management has been the one thing that stood out sort of subliminally, you know, just sort of below. The, it's, the se it's the second line in a lot of these readings, but wealth is incredibly strong. But then we have had asset markets that have had a nice bump in the past five, six months. So where's the standout in wealth as you look across the street? To your point, you say near perfect prints, according to Oppenheimer, for Goldman and Morgan Stanley, but the place that's less than perfect is in net interest income, and you saw that at the wealth manager over at Morgan Stanley. So to your point, assets are rising. They bought in a lot of money at their family office business. These are wealthier individuals, but you didn't see that same kind of heat over in the lending profits over at Morgan Stanley. Again, this is a perennial problem, but you have to remember Morgan Stanley was down quite significantly heading into this print. This is the first quarter of performance for the new CEO, of course, Ted Pick. Yep, uh, good news for Ted Pick. He's facing some other challenges, but as you say, a nice set of numbers to set the tone. Shanali, thank you so much for being on set with me. Let's continue that conversation. Cole Schmid of Smead Capital Management and Mo Hagbin of Invesco. Gentlemen, good morning to you. As you stand back and look at these behemoths of Wall Street reporting investment, banking has been a great tick in the box for Goldman Sachs. Here we are with the challenge of net interest income. Cole, if I look at the KBW, it still lags the rest of the market. A lot of people came on here and said, rotate into financials, rotate into energy. As you look at the results as we close off today on banking, are you convinced of a further rotation into banks. Good morning. Good morning, and thanks for having me, man. man uh, so to your point, um, I, I think the main thing we've drawn away from this is the near-term wins have been the investment banking wins. The problem with those is if you look at those, um, that was the same thing at the end of 21 before 22 fell, the, you know, dropped those away. So I say that because I think uh, really what the most attractive thing is is just old uh, commercial banking. 
who's cr collecting good net interest margins, even though uh, obviously the deposit costs have gone up. And not all will deal with that well, frankly. Um, obviously, the big banks dealt with big deposit inflows a year ago. And since they're not translating that into um, higher underwriting for new loans, it's causing drag on their net interest income. So I, I think that's the big, the big deal is, you know, how will the economy go so far? The economy is hot and no one seems to uh, be that excited about it. And I think that's a much more fundamental picture of the banks the next two to three years. Well, I think that's the sort of the restraint. They're just hesitant to get overly bullish on the economy. Mo, good morning to you. I, again, I know that you go for breadth, and I just wondered to what extent uh, this reporting season for the banks, some people argue it's peak net interest income. Others argue it's a strong economy and it will remain firm and credit provisions are low. How convinced are you that financials play an active participation in the breadth story for you? Yeah, thanks, Manny, for having me. Um, you know, we're very constructive, actually, overweight financials. And this quarter uh, was really a good quarter uh, for banks and asset managers, uh, financial sector in general. And if you think about kind of the components, um, you know, to Cole's point, net interest margin, uh, investment banking, um, asset management, trading in general, and, you know, the, the results were pretty good. Maybe a low bar, but those results were very good. And if you kind of think about the economy in the more macro uh, picture, we still think, you know, growth is actually better than expected uh, overall. So that exposure to cyclical stocks and cyclical factors is something that we continue to maintain. Look, one of the hottest topics in the latter part of last year, or certainly for most of last year, was CRE. We saw HSBC actively reduce their exposure to CRE. And many people have again said, don't worry about it. It's well spread out. Cole, you have actively sought out the differential, the differentiator when it comes to those banks and their exposure to CRE. How have you put that together in the portfolio financials? Well, that's a good question. I, I think um, the main thing is understanding the loan book of the company you're buying. Um, I think that's what's interesting to us. So, for example, last fall we got involved with three of the regional banks, which was Western Alliance, who was really in the heart of the storm a year ago, um, M&T Bank and Fifth Third Bank. And what we're looking at is what are, what are the loan books? And then secondly, if there are troubles, can they earn their way out of it? Just to give you some broad categories, um, it, coastal uh, is poorer than non-coastal, and urban is poorer than suburban. So I, I think of the working mom with two kids. Um, she will not commute over 30 minutes, and therefore there's a lot of CRE assets out there that are not very good. Um, the idea that we are going to build the post-pandemic world in shoving people back into urban cities that are degraded in many ways, um, that's not going to happen. So, you know, we, we live here in Phoenix, Arizona. I sit in a, in a suburban business district. That's the hottest part of office right now. And I think the people that have understood that and wanted to be interested in that risk before the pandemic started are being rewarded. One, one other thing I'll add, um, you know, we're probably going to lose 30 to 40 percent of the banks over the next decade because of either consolidation or more bank regulation picking up. So I think there will be winners and losers. I think banks will do good in general, but many won't. And to that point, I mean, we, if we go back one year ago, gentlemen, we were in the eye of a regional bank crisis. One of the debates that is gathering, gathering moss is the risk of a rate hike. Now, Nobody's saying that's what's going to happen, but it certainly was a lonely place to talk about that just a few weeks ago. Torsten Slock is talking about no rate hikes. Here we are with various people talking about potential rate hikes. UBS talking about 6.5%. How much or how much injury could that be to banks on hikes? I mean, you've got the interest side and then you have the risk to the real economy. Cole. Yeah, you need to slow down in the economy in a way that would cause the back book to become more onerous to a bank. And right now, I mean, I'll use, I'll use um, you know, the, the Bloomberg commentator uh, Larry Summers as an example. Uh, there's more arguments for a hike right now than there is a cut, in our opinion. And we think that's where the, the, where the power of the economy sits, really outside the Fed's hand. So we, we sit in this world right now that uh, people are arguing for all these issues in banking, and yet one of the most typical problems would be labor uh, problems, and then secondly, economic problems that follow. Housing would be a good problem too. You just can't find that. So I think all the, the typical negative arguments on banks just aren't there, and so people are going to more esoteric arguments of rate increases, you know, affecting obviously the capital, um, but those have to be called in uh, outside of held to maturity. 
So I, again, I, it, it, I can't, I'm not saying we won't have a recession at some point, we will. But, but again, the fiscal largesse of the U.S. federal government is so large that that's really what Jay Powell and the Fed are having to deal with, but that's benefiting the banks and the economy. And that delivers that U.S. exceptionalism pretty much at every turn. Um, Mo, for you, the, the risk, do you see the risk of, of a rate hike versus the beginning of a rate cutting cycle? We're going to revisit this in a moment, but just sort of to pit Cole and yourself uh, on your first take on that. Yeah, sure. I don't think, you know, we saw obviously the Bloom, uh, the, the UBS report, and that wasn't really their base case either. Uh, we don't think that, you know, rate hikes are kind of in the forecast. I would say we've seen peak rates. The question is, how quickly do we get cuts? And we've been talking a lot about this with clients. You know, at the beginning of the year, we were pricing six to seven cuts. You know, we never thought that was realistic. I still do think, uh, you know, the Fed would like to cut. So one to two cuts by the end of the year uh, seems to be kind of a, a reasonable place to at least forecast today. Um, I don't see hiking unless you see some really, really bad information or news on the inflation front. And really, that's the elephant in the room, right? So if inflation starts to become very, very problematic, mm -hmm. then the Fed actually needs to focus there. Because if you look at the dual mandate, their issue is more around the, the price stability, not around employment. Employment is not challenged at the moment. No, it's certainly not. And that unleashes then the argument where UBS are coming from, which is stockflation and maybe having to raise rates or the possibility of raising rates up to 6.5%. We thought Jamie Diamond was way out there at uh, this time last year. Uh, gentlemen, stay with me. More work to do. Cole Smead and Mo Hagben, uh, my guests this morning on Banks and Markets. Breaking news for you from the IMF. This is their view of the world. For 2024, they've upgraded their global growth forecast to 3.2 from 3.1%, a small and incremental move. But they talk about an uneven global growth and challenges ahead. And they are warning about the U.S. overspending and ballooning debt. We'll return to those headlines. Uh, but an upgrade for growth right now in 2024, and they leave 2025 unchanged at 3.2%. Let's go under the hood. Ahead of the opening belt, Simone is with me with the details. Simone. Well, Mattis, little surprise that Bank of America and Morgan Stanley are among the biggest movers, the most traded in equity markets this morning. Bank of America seeing one of the best first quarters on record with net interest income and equities trading, topping estimates, but those rising non-interest expenses up over 6% may be putting a ceiling on this name. Morgan Stanley up a nine-tenths of 1% this morning after trading and wealth management topped expectations. That's good news for new CEO Ted Pick. Evercore says, don't call it a comeback. The Morgan Stanley growth story has been here for years. Um, but the uh, shares moving the most are United Health. They had uh, been up uh, even more earlier this morning in the trading session. They experienced a February cyber attack, but earnings per share and revenue were able to come in ahead of estimates. And a lot of analysts have been concerned about rising medical costs, but United Health said they were in line with expectations. So positive news for them this morning as well, Manus. Okay, certainly one to watch, Simone. Thank you very much. Coming up, the IMF warns of an uneven global growth ahead. The authorities are a little bit frozen around the world as how do you react to generalized dollar strengthening? How do you react to generalized increase in interest rates in the U.S.? And unfortunately, in the past, when those two things go too far, they break something elsewhere. Mike McKee joins me to break down the latest IMF report and the warnings. Growth engines are very unequally distributed around the world right now. The authorities are a little bit frozen around the world as how do you react to generalized dollar strengthening? How do you react to generalized increase in interest rates in the U.S.? And unfortunately, in the past, when those two things go too far, they break something elsewhere. Now, IMF releasing its World Economic Outlook warning of the U.S. overspending and on debt, writing, quote, the exceptional recent performance of the United States is certainly impressive, but it reflects strong demand factors as well, including the fiscal stance that is out of line with the long-term fiscal sustainability. Something will have to give. Mike McKee is with me. That's quite a strong warning, Mike, isn't it? 
It is a strong warning, one that's likely to be ignored by the United States, but it does underscore the situation the U.S. finds itself in. The IMF, as you mentioned earlier, raising its global growth forecast for 2024 to 3.2%. And most of that, almost all of that, is due to the exceptional performance of the U.S. economy. They've raised the U.S. growth forecast by six-tenths of a percent to 2.7 percent for 2024, and even a boost in 2025 of two-tenths to 1.9. If you look at the rest of the chart there, everybody else is flat or down in the IMF forecasts among the major economies of the world. The IMF says the U.S. is being driven at this point by the exceptional spending of the pandemic that continues post-pandemic and that it risks raising interest rates around the world, which could, as Mohamed el Arian was just talking about, break the world economy. So there is some concern there. Uh, some good news, I suppose, if you want to look at it that way, the first bad news we've had in the economy in a little while, we see a big drop in U.S. housing starts of 14.7 percent, building permits also down. Not clear exactly what caused the drop. Uh, there's still a lot of demand out there, so most economists are saying they expect a rebound come uh, April, this month's data, when it is out. And finally, we've got to tell you about Philip Jefferson. He's the Fed's vice chair and the latest person to join the parade of people saying, don't get too excited about rate cuts. He says the outlook is still quite uncertain. And if incoming data suggests inflation is more persistent than I currently expect it to be, it will be appropriate to hold in place the current restrictive stance of policy for longer. So higher for longer if inflation doesn't come down from the Fed vice chair. We heard the same thing from John Williams, the New York Fed president, who's vice chair of the Open Market Committee. And this afternoon, we'll get the head of the Troika, Jay Powell, speaking, and we'll see if he is also on the same page. Going to bet, man, as he is. <laughs> Absolutely. But let's see if there's any more description about the bumps in the road and whether they're enduring and morphing into a hill. Unlikely we'll get that level of clarity. Mike, thank you very much. Mike McKee, uh, they're breaking down. Uh, some of the IMF report. Well, Col Smead and Mo Hagman are my guests this morning. Mm -hmm. So, gentlemen, here we are. The exceptionalism of the U.S. is personified in many ways. Uh, the dollar is a haven, uh, unreservedly a haven uh, in this geopolitical angst period of time. But there's the IMF talking about an exceptional growth period. Mo, I want to go to you first of all, because you say that you remain overweight risk in the portfolio on a global tactical basis. But non-U.S. equities, value and smaller caps are of appeal. Are you, you're not betting against the U.S., but you're just allocating more beyond borders? Yeah, great question. Well, so, you know, we... Oh, oh. To Mo. Yeah, so great question. Uh, you know, we do uh, maintain an overweight to risk assets, and really that means kind of overweight equities relative to fixed income. But within equities, uh, what we've been trying to do is broaden out uh, that, that exposure. So, you know, in the U.S. market, We've seen very heavy concentration and narrow leadership uh, with the AI theme uh, and, and, and IT. We believe that if the economy is as strong as uh, obviously the data suggests and, and resilient and expectations around growth are going to continue to improve, that the equity market would also broaden out. So smaller and mid-cap names, value-oriented companies, and to your earlier point, some uh, overweight to international and emerging market equities uh, as that reflation trade uh, broadens out beyond the U.S. And, you know, when we look at these markets at the moment, we're trying to understand we've got geopolitics and then we have a re-rating in the bond market. Two's trading up at 5% coal yesterday and a jolt, a jolt in yields that looks as if we're going to live in this higher for longer narrative unless real yield hunters come in. But when I look at all roads, they all converge towards the risk of inflationary shocks, whether it's war, whether it's the real economy, and that is the real risk that this equity market has got to try and grapple with, isn't it? Yeah, th there's no question that really uh, to understand the long-term inflation risk, um, the 10-year is the game. Um, if someone asked me uh, what would be the biggest nightmare for every asset owner in the world, regardless of private, public, doesn't matter, it'd be waking up on a 6% 10-year Treasury, because that would argue the market forces cannot see the Fed getting control of this. Now, I'm not here to necessarily criticize Jay Powell. They're doing as good as they can, or to put it in what Vol Paul Volcker said to Ronald Reagan when he came to office, um, Reagan said, hey, you know, some people don't think I should have a Fed chair. 
And Volcker said back, well, Mr. President, we're the only one fighting inflation here. The reality is the same thing's going on today. Like we talked about that fiscal spending. Now, one other thing I'll add to what your guest was just saying um, is that the main problem is American exceptionalism is being espoused in the S&P 500 globally and is being espoused in, as we know, very few companies. So the, the d real danger is this looks like Japan in 89 from an American perspective. It looks like Chinese stocks were in 2010. Um, the question is, um, you know, can the, the American markets hold that, uh, you know, hold that situation, that pedestal? I'll add one more thing. The dollar tends to do really poorly coming off of highs in equity markets and commodity bull markets that follow that. So if you go back and look, 02 was the high in the dollar. You woke up six years later, and Giselle, uh, Tom Brady's ex-wife, wanted to be paid in euros. Okay? So I just say that because that is how dangerous U.S. markets are to be a broadly diversified investor. I'm not saying you can't go own stocks. We do, um, but we're pretty narrow. And we don't so own Cole, the just, just, just to and qualify the this, I mean, you're making some, some big calls there. You're saying we are yes. in the United States of America are facing something like the 89 Japan situation, quite a, a toxic yeah. drawdown. You really think you could get equities down by that in mind in the space of 2024? What's the straw that breaks the camel's back on that? Yeah, it's, gonna, it's probably going to look like 72 to 74, where the, the Nifty 50 get crushed and everything gets crushed with it. I mean, that's, that's one plausible path. The only other path that you know, looks plausible is more like a 99 to 02, where we beat the hell out of things and the other things that weren't part of the glamorous part of the market actually appreciate. Those look like the two plausible paths. But I'll add one more way of looking at this. Cool. I, well, we don't really care what happens in the next 12 months. Uh, we think the S&P is going to make zero over the next decade. And that is the biggest risk, because those are nominal numbers. We, we, now we're back to debating inflation, and for sure it looks like negative real returns for equities in the S&P 500's case. Cole, I want a quick one-line response from Mo. Time is against this. Could it be as brutal as Cole lays out? Mo. I, uh, we are much more constructive on equities over the long term. And if you kind of look at the last 100 years of equity performance, you know, capital market expectations is you're probably still going to see a pretty okay. significant positive return. I don't think I've got a convulsion like, like Japan left in me. Gentlemen, thank you very much. Cole Smead, Mo Hadman, my guest this morning. Uh, coming up on the show, uh, Emily Hill from Barasok Capital Partners joins me right here on Bloomberg. Good morning, calls. First up, HSBC raises its recommendation on AMD to a buy, seeing more AI-driven upside. Wells Fargo upgrades Kroger to overweight, seeing fundamental improvements. And finally, Bank of America initiates coverage on Reddit with a neutral rating. Starting on materially firmer ground today, you saw pretty heavy losses yesterday on the rise in yields. And again this morning, a small uh, tick higher on yields. The narrative about rate hikes, it's no longer a barren country to talk about that. Torsten Slot talking about no rate hikes. Uh, UBS talking about 6.5%. There is the opening bell. Again, banks are very, very much in focus with Morgan Stanley along with Bank of America today. Uh, both doing nicely. There's the nicely opening. I should just say and point out to you that uh, Bloomberg Media uh, ringing the opening bell today at the NASDAQ market website. There you go, ticker tape and all. A uh, couple of other uh, asset classes to keep your eyes across is, of course, euro dollar. Now, if there is a material divergence between the Fed and the ECB, we had a conversation this morning on Bloomberg Brief, that parity comes a lot more quickly uh, for the euro dollar. Ten-year yields rising again this morning. Uh, again, the narrative is about a higher for longer period and no rate cuts is a bill narrative. Crude down by an eighth of 1% this morning and change. We wait to see what the Israeli response to the Iran uh, to the Iran missile barrage into Israel will be. Two stocks that we're keeping an eye on, Morgan Stanley, as I say, and Bank of America. Both of these banks topping the estimates. Bank of America notching up one of the best first quarters on record. Shanali is with me. You've had a pretty long couple of days on these banks. But Bank of America, I think the language that Moynihan uses and indeed the breadth 
of his outperformance is, is interesting. Well, a few things on net interest income. Not only have they beat market expectations, you also hear them now telling analysts that they expect NAI to bottom in the second quarter of this year, so the current quarter, and then start to improve into the second half. You have Bank of America talking about the impact of higher interest rates, expecting to keep on benefiting through them throughout the year, and is also saying that a lot of the larger clients have gotten used to the higher rate structure. So you were seeing this higher for longer starting to feed through and become maybe Manus the new normal. You also hear him talking about efficiency. Mike Mayo, a bank analyst, of course, famed bank analyst known to push the banks, is asking about the efficiency ratio and when Bank of America can get it under 60 percent. And you had Moynihan, Brian Moynihan's commitment here that they are working on driving that efficiency to a better place, particularly with the use of technology. As we know, headcount has been on the decline at a lot of these banks. Yep, certainly uh, the costs were one of the issues with JP Morgan when we looked at that on Friday, and their underperformance on NII or their under guidance on AII, one should say, is something that, uh, well, took a little bit of a sting uh, for JP Morgan. Shanali, thank you very much. Let's turn our attention to Johnson & Johnson, the company's first quarter. Nice beat on the estimates with the drug sales coming in higher than we expected. Simone Foxman has the details. Simone. Yeah, Manus, T.D. Cowan says that this was a solid first quarter print for the pharmaceutical company, but markets not so enthused in early trading with shares down over 1%. Diving into the numbers here, earnings per share coming in at $2.71. The estimate had been for $2.65. Sales were roughly in line with expectations. Interesting if you dive into the details there. Uh, we saw anti-cancer drug Darzalex sales there overtaking the psoriasis arthritis drug drugs that had been the mainstay of JNJ's drug sales uh, for a long time, Stellaris, uh, which it saw sales of $2.5 uh, billion. That missed expectations slightly, and it's facing generic competition in Europe. So interesting changing of the guard there. But not everyone liking JNJ's full-year outlook, now seeing profits of $10.57 to $10.72 a share. That's tightening that range. Bloomberg Intelligence thinks the outlook is still conservative, but investors have to focus a little bit farther out on the medium term. Of course, T.D. Cowan thinks we're going to see a reversal in some of the negative trends this morning as we head through the trading day, Manus. Okay, Simone, let's keep an eye on that stock price down 1% and change. Sticking with the healthcare industry, United Health they beat on profit estimates despite the cost impact associated with a cyber attack. Uh, Denise Sakova joins me with the latest. There's the stock roaring ahead up over 5.5%. Denise yeah, Manus, uh, United Health is having a great day. Um, the company beat estimates. Uh, profits uh, came above what Wall Street was expecting. Outlook was affirmed. It is indeed quite strong. Of course, everyone has been nervous about that uh, cyber attack that we saw in February and its impact on the healthcare industry. But so far, the results have been good. In fact, adjusted earnings per share came at 6.91, well above what Wall Street expected, which was 6.59. Revenue came at just below. 100 billion, which was also above what uh, uh, estimates show. Uh, the price rose by 7.5, which is quite early for investors. We know the stock has suffered a lot this year. It was down 15% before the earnings report and was significantly uh, underperforming the S&P 500. Uh, what is more, this brought relief to some of the other healthcare names, including CVS. Uh, and one of the comments that perhaps boosted investor confidence was that those higher medical costs are actually good news for investors so far. Uh, the cyber attack on its own, its impact was 832 million, but some of it was around two thirds were adjusted. It's not part of these earnings. Of course, it's important to say that uh, United Health did a biggest uh, buyback of three billion, so that has perhaps boosted uh, the earnings per share. Back Denise, to you, Denita. Thank you so much. Let's turn our attention to the entertainment world. The Justice Department may file an antitrust complaint as soon as next month. It's aimed at forcing Live Nation to spin off Ticketmaster and Wall Street Journal are carrying this story. So Alex Seminova has more. This has certainly irked the market. Indeed, Manus. Well, Live Nation has been under investigation by the DOJ for years now over concern that it's harming consumers through its dominance in the live event space. So the agency... Uh, 
preparing to file this lawsuit is perhaps a long time coming here. The Wall Street Journal reported that the suit could come as soon as next month, though the details of the lawsuit are not immediately clear at this point. It's unclear whether it would call for a breakup of Ticketmaster and Live Nation, which had merged back in 2010. Shares of Live Nation are down 8% here. That is the biggest uh, decline since February 24th, 2023. Coming into this session, the stock had been up about 7% year to date. And Live Nation is, of course, the parent company of Ticketmaster. The company drew the ire of US, uh, the U.S. government and regulators back in 2022 after a system meltdown let millions of people unable to purchase tickets to Taylor Swift's Eras Tour. So perhaps some vindication here for the Swifties if this lawsuit gets filed. Uh, analysts at Benchmark call this familiar regulatory terrain, uh, but they say that they wouldn't be surprised if the DOJ did uh, did file this lawsuit, given the fact that it's a le an election year and both parties want to woo in younger voters. At Cowan, analysts said it's unclear if the lawsuit would call, call for a breakup of Live Nation and Ticketmaster. They said that a potential divestiture of Ticketmaster is a negative for Live Nation stock. Menace. Be careful of the retribution of those Swifties. Alex, thank you very much. Alex Seminova. Uh, so what are investors grappling with? Uh, multiple issues. We've got the threat of an Israeli counter-strike. Emily Hill of Bauer Sock Capital Partners joins me next saying this. Geopolitical risks are usually elevated and are likely to remain so. The risk of an expanded conflict in the Middle East that could significantly diminish the odds of a soft landing is higher than investors really appreciate. And I should say unusually elevated, uh, just to correct myself. Emily is with me at the moment. Look, all roads in this situation, by the way, we should just say that at the start of the show, Putin, uh, we understand, had a conversation with Raisi, that is the Iranian president, calling for restraint. So that is an interesting development as we try to grapple with what happens next here. But if I look at all roads, it is about inflation, inflation shock in commodities, inflation shock in supply chains. It is about the risk of an expanded shock here that these markets are trying to grapple with, Emily, isn't it? Yes. And to be clear, typically a war of this type does not have a long-term impact on markets. And stock markets have tended to do well even in periods of rising oil prices. The difference now is that the inflation threat is quite different than it has been for, you know, 20 plus years. And so a shock that drives oil up above $100 a barrel could derail this bull market. I think currently we're in a correction, but that's a, a, a high risk. If, I was listening to Mohammed al a little bit earlier on surveillance, and he said, if I came into the studio at the start of the year and said, we're only going to have two rate cuts, and I'll give you 7% return on the S&P, you would have thought we were mad. Here we are. We are at two cuts and counting down to zero, potentially. This stock market, it almost felt as if yesterday the stock market was beginning to lose its immunity to a higher rate regime. You know, at this time last year, the market was pricing in an August 2023 rate cut. So the market has continued to be way too optimistic about rate cuts. I would expect one this year at the most in September, and I wouldn't be surprised at all to see none. We are in a permanently higher inflation environment due to headwinds that are really beyond the Fed's control. One of them is the geopolitical risks that we just talked about. Another mm -hmm. is climate change, continued supply shocks resulting from that. We've got demographic issues and some and a restricted labor force. Historically, a four to five percent wage growth is inconsistent with two percent inflation. The Fed may have to recognize eventually that they're not going to get inflation down below two point five percent. I mean, that would be to admit defeat, wouldn't it? It would. <laughs> I hope they don't have to, but it's possible. If we look at the other side of the equation, you, Larry Summers, a number of weeks ago on, on Wall, Street, Wall Street Week, came out with a view that there was a non-negligible risk that the Fed would have to raise rates. Here we are, Torsten Slock talks about no rate cuts, and we've got UBS talking about 6.5%, flying a kite that there could be stockflation and that the Fed would need to raise rates to 6.5%. I mean, what is the risk to global markets and sentiment and equities, specifically equities, 
if the Fed did have to start hiking again, because if they open the door to one hike, it says that we're in a new cycle and that cycle is potentially hikes and that's what the market would discount. I think we are in a new cycle, but I think the more likely thing would be that the Fed would start to run off its balance sheet faster, which would push interest rates up. I think the likelihood of an additional hike is quite low. Uh, I think that would be very disruptive for global markets, and the Fed knows it, so they will avoid that that at all, if at all possible. They have an, they have other ways of slowing down the economy absent that. Do you think? I mean, the one thing that we heard is that we may well be in a position to slow the pace of QT. It's 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 ironic. You're one of the first people to sort of say, well, actually, Manus, the other principle could be that they leave QT running as it is, or indeed. Um, accelerated, and that to you would be less damaging to risk assets. It would perhaps tighten FCON a little bit, but may not be a demolition for risk assets. I think accelerating the runoff of the balance sheet is a way of more quietly raising interest rates, and it's politically more palatable. I think after a pause of this long, it, I would be surprised yeah. to see a rate hike. Let's just put it that way. Not at all surprised to see no rate cut throughout 2024 and possibly even through the first quarter of 2025. Yeah, I mean, that's the eminently more sensible and, and less aggravating uh, issue. The other, the other markets that are literally sparkling at the moment are gold. We've talked a little bit about the commodity side, but you've got gold, you've got some sanctions on some of the base metals uh, against Russia. I'm just curious, we've got City talking about gold at $3,000 uh, in 18 months time. Would there be anything make you buy gold? I think we've got a different environment here for gold than we've had for 30 years. And that environment is there are central banks around the world that would rather not rely as heavily on the dollar and on U.S. Treasuries as they, as they have in the past. It was very evident by what the U.S. did with seizing Russian assets and, and controlling world events with the dollar. is something that a lot of emerging markets in India, for example, would prefer to avoid. So one of the things we're seeing, in addition to Chinese retail buyers, is central banks accumulating more gold. And I think that momentum is probably going to continue. It surprised everyone because typically the opportunity cost of holding gold when you can have, you know, you can own cash for four and a half percent is high. But I think you've got different factors at play here. I have indeed. Uh, it, it's interesting to see those central banks just continually, continually, especially the RBI, they've just confirmed their appetite for gold along with the PBOC. Emily, it could be much, much bigger uh, cycles going on uh, under the hood. Emily Barsok of Hill. Uh, Emily Barsock, I should say, or Hill of Barsock Capital Partners. Many thanks. Coming up, tensions are simmering in the Middle East. Israel proved it has superior military capability, and just as critically, they don't stand alone, that the United States, stand, the United States stands with them. There's no question that Iran recognizes uh, uh, the coalition that was put together uh, to, help, uh, to help Israel defend itself. The world awaits Israel's response to Iran's attack over the weekend. That conversation ahead on Bloomberg. Israel proved it has superior military capability and just as critically, they don't stand alone, that the United States, stand, the United States stands with them. There's no question that Iran recognizes uh, uh, the coalition that was put together uh, to, help, uh, to help Israel defend itself. Again, I, I can't speak for what either side will do going forward. Iran is increasingly isolated on the world stage. Uh, they are increasingly uh, making it harder for anybody in the international community uh, to be sympathetic to any of their uh, inimical interests there. Iran, Israel vowing to respond to Iran's weekend drone and missile attack. Now, this is as the U.S. and European officials are looking to avoid an escalation that could provoke a wider war. Meanwhile, on Capitol Hill, uh, the House Speaker, Mike Johnson, is planning to hold votes on new aid to Israel and Ukraine and Taiwan this week. Mark Champion is with me uh, to make, try 
and make sense of this. Mark, Israel vows to respond uh, with more severe, faster and more immediate blow. Um, how does Israel respond, to, to try and make sense of this, without literally creating some kind of systemic risk in the system. They need to respond. That seems to be accepted now, even though you've had voices of restraint from Macron, from Schultz, and from David Cameron. What does a non-massive escalatory response look like? Yeah, it's a very good question. I mean, there are a lot of things that they can do. Um, I think the biggest question will be whether they decide uh, to it attack Iranian territory directly or whether, again, as they have before, uh, to attack Iranian assets outside of Iran, even including when um, they hit uh, a consulate in, in Syria, in Damascus, which was the, the strike that, uh, you know, caused the uh, Iranian retaliation. So, um, you know, they, they do have options. There, there are things that they can strike inside Iran, but, you know, as soon as you move across the border, that will uh, begin to increase the risk. Uh, and, of, of course, as soon as you start to take lives, uh, you make it very difficult for the other side then not to say that they need another round of retaliation. So it's, it is extraordinarily difficult to, to pull off. Um, and what the Iranians did was, was you know, very high risk. Um, you know, there, there is a, an argument that they also were trying to do something that wouldn't force a, a major escalation toward a regional war, something that they don't want, that they might not win. Uh, so, you know, and, uh, but they kind of got away with it, if you like, in, in the sense that, um, you know, there was very little damage in Israel. Most stuff got shot down and they could still claim victory. What the Israelis will do, I, I seriously don't know. Um, but they're under a lot of pressure at the moment, but um, I'm sure that they will respond in some form. Your interpretation of the headline that we had just under 50 minutes ago, that Putin asked for restraint. Now, this was in a conversation, we understand, with Raisi. This was a statement released uh, by the Kremlin. I think it's quite an interesting um, situation to have Russia so publicly uh, step in and ask for restraint. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the Russians have, uh, you know, un, uh, this is a change for them, but they have, uh, since the war in Gaza, they've really taken a, a, a strong stance in favor of Iran uh, and uh, against uh, Israel. Um, previously, they'd always been, you know, much more ambiguous, uh, but now they've, they've, they've taken a very clear side. Um, and at this point, to, to call for restraint, you're, you're, what you're calling for after, you know, Iran has fired more than 300 uh, missiles into at Israel, um, you're calling on the Israelis to restrain themselves and not respond. As it happens, again, unusually, that, that is exactly what the U.S. Uh, is asking for as well, uh, simply because it doesn't want a regional war. Yep. Uh, I mean, certainly if you look at the French, they want to avoid flare-ups, a calibrated manner of response. Schultz is anxious to avoid escalation in the G7, an uncontrollable regional escalation. I think part of the, the, the verbiage there, Mark, is, is the divergence between the West and the Middle East in the comprehension of the situation and culture. Mark, thank you very much. That is Mark, uh, champion of Bloomberg Opinion. Some of the sector price action. Let's get back to Simone. Yeah, Manis, most um, uh, the broader indice is moving sideways this morning, but if you look under the hood at the S&P 500, you'll see real estate is leading the downside after housing starts came in pretty light. Utilities, we've also seen energy distributors pressured. Uh, to the upside, chip makers appear to be back at it, uh, leading the charge in the infotech. Uh, consumer staples led by Tyson getting a double upgrade at Barclays. But one thing I want to point out, because we had some news about it this morning, is our healthcare space. Uh, it's been the worst performing sector so far this quarter, down over 6%. But it had that positive story today from United Health. Analysts have been particularly concerned about the impact of medical costs. We have aging patients doing more costly procedures, but United Health said their costs were in line with expectations. We get Humana's results next week. We'll see if that story continues and if there is a turnaround for the healthcare space menace. Simone, thank you very much, Simone Foxman there. Coming up, market moving events to set your diary by on Bloomberg.
your trading diary. What do you need to keep an eye on? Fed speak coming down. We've got Powell, Barkin, Williams and Collins. Then after the bell, we're going to get the United Airlines earnings. Wednesday, it is the beige book from the Fed. And there will be a Senate subcommittee hearing on Boeing's safety. Thursday, it's all about Netflix. What are you watching? And are you sharing your passwords? That was Countdown to the Open. The rest of the team will take you through the trading day. We're counting down to what Jay Powell has to say, perhaps soothing the nerves of a frayed bond market. Good morning from Bloomberg.